Hi, I'm Mark Johnson and today I'm going to talk about reading. And in order to participate in the activity I want you to do, I want you to have a book to hand. So please, very quickly, just find a book. Um, just pause the video, go and find a book. Uh, it doesn't really matter what it is, but I want you to feel really good before you open the book and just open it at any page. It's almost like put a, pulling a random card from a pack of cards and just seeing what card it is. Have a look at the page. Scan the words. What do you see? Suddenly you're immersed in something different. It might be really boring, but actually just, just, just wallow in it for a bit. Think what you're thinking as you look at the words. And you might think actually that's not so interesting so just flick to another page in the book what do you see now what are you thinking now how does what you're thinking now relate to what you were thinking when you opened the first page do you think it was at all significant that the book opened at the particular page that you looked at now the question is nobody teaches us to read after we've learnt the basics in primary school and there is a huge difference between the mechanics of reading, of you know, making sense of words, and the actual business of making something meaningful to us. But as, as academics, we have to make things meaningful to us. There's some good historical advice about reading. The first uh, thing to say is that most academics do not read things through from cover to cover. Um, there's a very famous quote from uh, Dr. Samuel Johnson about this. He was challenged by a man called Elphinstone um, as to whether he had read a whole book through from cover to cover. And Johnson just said, no, sir, do you read books through? Reading things through is generally not what we do. We tend to open things at random, flick through pages. But that does re raise the question as to what we are doing. It may be, as C.S. Lewis pointed out, that we're really reading to understand other people. Lewis said, we read to know we are not alone. What I want to suggest is, building on my activity from uh, last week's um, lesson in, the, in this course, I want to talk about identifying the constraints of an author. And we're going to come back to this idea of the three constraints. So we've got analytical constraints that... Um, an author proposes some sort of logic, logical solution to a problem. What logic do they expose? There's some kind of experiential constraint. In what way does the author draw on their own experience? Or does, do they appeal to common sense in support of an argument? And then finally, there are critical constraints. To what extent does an author express doubts about any position that they present? To what extent are they aware of political um implications of what they're talking about, to what extent do they criticise other people's work. Now I talk about constraints because in a sense this these are the things that weigh upon an author as they go through the process of writing and so your business in reading is trying to understand the author. It's again it's Lewis talking about knowing that we're not alone. So just as we did last week we have these three bubbles, experiential constraints analytical constraints, critical constraints. You work those out by looking at the words, but the fundamental question you're asking is in the middle, which is, what is the author's question? What are they about? What's really driving them? And of course, the other thing that you may well be thinking is, what is my question, your question, as you're looking at the constraints of this author? How do your constraints relate to their constraints. And this leads you on to a kind of treasure hunt um, within a text as you look out for those parts of the text which are to do with experience, those parts which are to do with analysis, and those parts which are to do with critique. And this is what I want you to be thinking about this week. And I've set you a little exercise where there are two texts. Now, actually, they're, they're small sections of texts which you can read for free um, in Amazon's um, book preview. Completely different texts. One is by T.S. Eliot, who was a very famous poet, who wrote a wonderful book about culture in which he actually, at the end of it, he talks a lot about education. I'll talk about that in a minute. But 
Um, I just want you to read the beginning of this book just to see how Eliot is writing, how he's framing his arguments, what his constraints are. And then the other book is by Jilly Salmon, who's written a book on e-moderating, which is an aspect of e-learning, and a very short section of the beginning of her book, again, to get you a feel for how she is thinking. So, your task this week is to produce a list of the analytical, experiential and critical constraints that you see operating for Eliot and for Salmon. Write down what you see as the key features of the text that you read that fit into these categories. So this is, this is kind of just looking at the text and thinking, well, what is it? In each case, there may be one category, analysis, critique or experience, which is stronger than the other, and there may be one category which is not there at all. Identify where this might be the case and think about it because what does the presence or absence of a category for a particular author mean? And finally, write what this tells you about the kind of people these authors are, or were in the case of Eliot. I, I want you to do this very briefly, no more than 600 words, so it's not a, a, an, an onerous task. And I want you to send it to me before the 2nd of February. Um, and next week, um, this will provide this exercise will provide the basis for a critical introduction to writing. I want to, having looked at reading, I then now want to look at writing. But now I just want to talk through my experience of reading the Eliot and the Salmon. So I hope you enjoy this. If you don't feel that you want to do it, then you need to just put yourself in a frame of mind where you really do want to do it, because you can't read anything unless you feel like you're really enjoying yourself. Okay, so I look forward to seeing your work. Now, this is me looking at uh, the notes towards the definition of culture. Um, this is quite an old book. I think one of the nicest things about it is I like the fact that on, right on that front page, he's seen the need to define definition. So forget about culture, he's writing a definition of culture, he has to define definition. So I'm opening it up, uh, we move on to the preface to the 1962 edition. This book was written in, I think, 1948, so uh, this is a bit of a rethink, and he's just explaining. I think the, the thing that comes across here is it took a bit of a, it took quite a long time to write. Um, he's really thought about this. And um, so there's the table of contents, um, just having a quick look at the introduction there. But no, let's come back to the contents. I'm interested in a particular part of this book, which is the notes on education and culture. Um, so it's, it's the thing that he has to say about education, which is of particular interest to me. And he starts by um, just talking about the fact that education is of interest to lots, lots of people. Uh, there are lots and lots of people who have written about education um, during the recent war, and um, recent war being the Second World War for him. And then he starts to say, well, there are lots of different positions people take about this, and he's going to list the positions and then discuss them. One of the positions is that um, before saying anything about education, you have to say something about the purpose of education. And then he's got this long, long section where he talks about the different views about the purpose of education. Um, and there's some very interesting things here. So, for example, he picks up this um, survey um, for the church. The, church um, so the churches survey their task, it's called, a volume published in connection with the Oxford Conferences on Church, Community and State in 1937. And um, he picks up this particular phrase, which is, the purpose of education, it seems, is to transmit culture. And remember, this is a book about culture, so, uh, you know, his obvious question might then be, well, what do you mean by culture? Um, and that's, that sort of leads to a, a more detailed discussion. And then he talks about other authors and um, people who might disagree. So, for example, he's got Mr. Herbert Reed at the top there. Uh, who might well disagree with Mr. Dent, um, who wants full democracy, and you know, he's, he's talking about deep things about politics and democracy. How is Eliot thinking here? Is this analysis? Is it about experience? Is it critique? That's that's what I want you to be thinking when you read your part of this text. 
Elliot is very keen on uh, this very simple uh, definition of, of um, education uh, we, uh, by, I think it's uh, Dr. Jode, and um, he's saying that um, actually this is the simplest thing, to enable every boy or girl to earn his or her living, to equip him to play his part as a citizen of democracy, and to enable him to develop all the latent powers and faculties of his nature and so enjoy a good life. Elliot thinks this is this is very sensible. So what does that tell us? How is he thinking when he argues for that kind of thing? Um, is this is this he's, he's he's sort of seen something there which is making him you know think ah oh, yes maybe there's a plan. So what what sort of what's is that analysis? Is it critique? Is it um, is it uh, drawing from experience? So. That's that's quite a long section just on this first point that you can't discuss education without discussing the purpose of education and this is this is a very quite a sophisticated argument anyway he comes on to his second point that education makes people happier um, and so Elliot comes in here and says well hang on what do we mean oh is this right um, he doesn't spend an awfully long time doing that. Um, uh, so he sort of comes on. I, I'm just, basically, I'm sort of now flicking through this because I can begin. I'm not. Don't have to read this from cover to cover all the way through. I'm just saying I can see all these points that he's he's pointing out, and this point five, the the one that he points five, the mute inglorious Miltons as he calls it, which is a very uh, posh way of saying um, that every child. Um, if they're educated properly, could turn into a genius. And he's challenging this. He's saying, well, you know, are we sure? Um, or, you know, is, is this some sort of idealism? Now, how is he feeling? How is he thinking when he's arguing that kind of thing? Is that an analytical proposition? Is it critique that he's doing? Or is it drawing from experience? Um, so again, he, he's got this long, long section where he's really sort of digging into this. And then I'm, I'm again. I'm, I'm browsing through. I'm, I'm thinking through to the end. And um, okay, so here at the end, I can uh, just skimming this. I can see that he's asking whether it's possible to um, have an education which improves culture. Um, whether you can only possibly hope for something which provides the means that are favourable to culture. This is one of the arguments that he's 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 really sort of saying that actually you can't have um, a, a sort of idea of culture that somehow culture is made and then education's job is to impose that culture on young minds. That's what he's saying at the bottom of that page. So he worries about this idea of some sort of ideal perfect culture and then education is just the, the sort of tool for Im imprinting that culture on everybody. He's saying culture is a living thing. Um, now, and so this is, this is, you know, what, what is that? What is, is that a, a critical argument? Is it, is it an analytical proposition? Is he, is he proposing some sort of better society here as he's doing this? That's what I want you to be thinking. Let's look at Jimmy, Jilly Salmon. So this is a very quick, I've sped this up even more actually, it's a very quick look at Jilly Salmon's book and I can see this is all about training and e-moderators, um, the resources for practitioners, there's all sorts of things here just flicking through it. E-moderation um, is, is the new generation of teachers um, who are ex um, inhabiting this world of technology and education. And so this is about building a model of online teaching and learning. She's got something about her methodology. And then there's this diagram. And what's that all about? The five-stage model. And the methodology tells us how she got to her five-stage model. How's she thinking here? What's going on here? And then all of these um, resources that she's got. These are guidelines for teachers. Um, so, you know, things like um, things which look at the impact of success. Um, E-moderating skills, components of online socialization. So again, more more advice and guidance as to how um, what people should do. So she's writing this. How is she thinking? Is this critique? Is it analysis? Is it some sort of proposition, or is it to do with experience? Um, 
Differences between summarising and weaving. Well, of course, we don't know what summarising or weaving are, so we'd have to look at the book to find out. Um, uh, all sorts of things about hierarchy, cultural issues, actually back to Eliot there, um, sort of uh, things on skills and... Um, sorry, I'm just flicking through too fast now, I can't read it. Um, so it's the key to online teaching and learning. That's quite a strong statement. Um, so, and then she's talking about um, the different scenarios which um, might feature in, or you can think about, in terms of the way we think about online learning. So she has her first scenario, which is called Planet Contentious. And um, this, she describes this sort of... Um, particular scenario with its features and then another one planet instancia and she describes that um, I, I, I can't sort of work out exactly how these are different but in, in imagining these different scenarios what's she doing is this analysis is this critique planet nomadic there's another one well what's that um, so She's talking, and then this this last one here is the planet Cafe Latia. Um, I think she's imagining. I mean, these words do suggest something, don't they? Sort of nomadia, Cafe Latia. So, and then she asks a question: What planet are you on? So she's trying to provide some sort of category for helping people to think about their own practice. Um, how is she thinking in trying to do that? How is she thinking? Is she thinking analytically? Is she thinking critically? Is she thinking experientially? And we've got this stuff here on um, uh, the, the, the different types of uh, ways of training teachers and um, all sorts of um, lots of practical information. This is a very practical book and um, to be fair, it's it's been very popular. Okay, so I'm hoping that's been slightly useful, at least uh, a very very quick uh, run through these two two books. In the sections of text that um, I've given you as an exercise to write about, I want you to be a bit more specific. So you know, if you think that the author is being experiential, if they're drawing on experience, just cite, just show exactly, well, where's, where is that happening? Um, if they're being analytical, where is that happening? If they're being critical, what's, what's the evidence for that? So you actually focus on those parts of the text which fit those categories. I'm sure that you'll find that one or two of these categories are missing in each of these authors. And Think about what that tells you. These are very, very different people. And they are, although they're talking about things which are related at a very deep level, how are these people different? And how is the difference between these people exemplified by what they're writing? And um, I look forward to seeing your work. Thank you.